Hello and let's talk about the Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna Awards. These awards along with the Arjuna Awards and the Dronacharya Awards were announced on Saturday. This year has been unique when it comes to these awards as for the first time five sportspersons were awarded the Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna Award. That's the highest honor awarded to a sportsperson in the country. These are cricket player Rohit Sharma, table tennis player Manika Batra, Indian women's hockey captain Rani Rampal and Team Mariyappan who is a Paralympian along with wrestler Vinesh Fogat. The same happened with the Arjuna Awards too with 27 sports persons receiving the coveted award. 13 coaches have been presented with the Dronacharya Award, 8 of whom have won it in the lifetime achievement category. This is despite the rule stating that except in exceptional circumstances, only one sports person would be conferred with the Rakhil Ratna Award and 15 would get the Arjuna Award. These announcements have left the sporting fraternity and sports watchers a bit puzzled and even bemused, with questions being raised as to what this implies for the award system itself. We talked to News Click's Leslie Xavier on this issue. Leslie, thank you for joining us. So the Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna, Arjuna and Dronacharya awardees have been named and it's quite a big list this time. So uh, there's been a lot of commentary about that, of course, and these are some of the most important awards in Indian sport. So do you see, how do you, first of all, how do you see this huge number of uh, candidate awardees who have been given this award, especially at this time? Uh, it's a... Uh, uh unprecedented circumstances are happening around the world so unprecedented list of awardees so i one can't i mean possibly find a logic to this because as we as we know it's a year where there is no sporting action at all but yeah let's let's give the benefit of the doubt that awards are decided not by this year's performance alone but the previous two years that's the that's the criteria set by the uh, arjuna award uh, rules as well as the Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna rules. But the point is that there are certain rules that have been stipulated as far as the number of athletes who can be considered for the award every year. And in Khel Ratna, the rule is uh, pretty straightforward. Every year, one awardee, because it's it's considered the topmost award of a country. So, uh, one award, unless there is unprecedented circumstances like for instance, an Olympic year where just before the awards, if, if three, four athletes have won Olympic medals, obviously they, they all deserve Kail Ratna. So that happened in 2016, four athletes were considered. And uh, this is say Olympic year as well, but Olympics have, hasn't happened. And the award list also is questionable that way. Uh, the presence of certain athletes in it. Uh, for instance, someone like Manika Batra, whose performance Whose, uh, the award has been given based based on her victories in the Commonwealth Games. Uh, with all this due respect to the victories and the medals won, it's also very clear that Commonwealth Games is not exactly the pinnacle of, uh, I mean, standard-wise, it's not an, exactly the pinnacle in table tennis. Uh, so, uh, she would have been a, I mean, much more of a bigger name in table tennis world had she won a medal, just a medal, not even gold in the Asian Games. So that's a, that's a, that's a, so there are hierarchies in sport as well. So, I mean, rather than get into the eligibility of these athletes, because uh, it's a given that all these athletes are international athletes and they have at some point won certain medals uh, at the Asian level, at the Commonwealth level, regardless of whatever the quality of the field as such. But when a criteria is set for the number of awards to be given, and also, when we are considering these to be the most sought after awards for sports persons in the country, Dronacharya has yes, had, had a mythical proportions attached to it. We, are, we were all in awe when we were sports persons ourselves. We would look look up to people who are who have won Drona, I mean, uh, Arjuna Award and uh, Kail Ratna came in later. So, so. By by diluting its its uh, quality that way by giving I mean I know uh, applications might have come I know uh, committee might have deliberated all, all of that uh, we will get into the deliberation part of it in the, uh, later in this conversation so but but still if there is a set criteria that per year only one award for Kail Ratna and on up to fifteen. Which has been relaxed up to 17 till previous years, but right now it's 27 Arjuna awards. That's that's too much, and it's just it just kills the the uh, stature of the award. It dilutes it. I mean, much much like many of the institutions that has been 
uh, whose station has been killed killed by the current disposition this also is going that way right so could we talk a bit about uh, what the procedure is usually how does it happen was it any different this year and how does this whole system work during the time of the pandemic itself so uh, the usual case it's uh, the federations that uh, nominate uh, at least for the arjuna award and the kel ratna so uh, they are their own internal mechanisms how how they decide which athlete to push for the arjuna award nominate for the arjuna award of course there is a side side track to it, track to it about political push that happens i mean the ruling government if you have people who can back you then there is a sure shot case that you might win the award so it's all this thing but general set procedure is that the federation federation nominates you pushes your application and then there is a arjuna award committee and a kelatna committee which is con convened and they deliberate over over the list and then they uh, shortlist it and then the final award is uh, uh, approved the the uh, committee members come from various fields uh, i mean sports persons former sports persons are there administrators are there of course the ministry officials and and the sports minister presides over all these things and uh, at the same time uh, media persons are also there sports journalists are also part of it now it's a it's a different question whether whether sports journalists have a say in it on a larger sense because you are sitting with former sports persons and administration so they but still their voice will also be heard i'm sure and so uh, but the nomination procedure is where the trick happens it's uh, there is a lot of politics in the in the sports uh, organizations in the country so if you are on the wrong side of the of the federation as an athlete your name will never get pushed and in that regard there have been a couple of uh, names which have been, which which is i mean which makes me happy that they have finally got their due in this year's list and they got their due because there was a slight change in the procedure this time around uh, apart from the federation's uh, nominations this year because of pandemic and the restrictions that it it, it brought out uh, self nominations were allowed so many athletes pushed their own applications themselves and uh, so a couple of them uh, come to my mind immediately one is shivake shivan the winter olympian <laughs> he uh, is listed for arjuna award this year his prime was around 10 years back where he was asian champion and yes he, he has been an olympian uh, on multiple occasions and the and, and on multiple occasions the only athlete to compete in winter olympics from india that so he's pretty famous in the winter olympics world but not exactly a household name in india and uh, he always had problems with the federation he always used to call them out for lack of support and lack of initiatives to Im improve the stature of the uh, of winter sport in the country considering that we are blessed with some amazing uh, resorts and uh, skiing slopes and it's it's a surprise that india doesn't produce enough winter olympians so uh, hs pranoy is another name badminton player he has been fighting to for the you know for a while and he also has been listed. so uh, that's the market uh, difference that has happened this year compared to last year self nominations so in this context the key question that comes is that like you pointed out sports is at the end of the day it's a very there's a lot of politics happening around it and uh, awards are often are at the time when a lot of this politics comes out and a lot of this politics is into play so are there any uh, kind of say mechanisms to ensure say some of these issues can be resolved or some of these issues can be streamlined better so that athletes get more Uh, say athletes get recognized more easily, and that there's maybe less politics on the one. That's one one question. And on the other hand, does it look like this kind of a uh, say jumbo award system is likely to stay, or will it? Is it likely to be a one-year exception? It's. Uh, I mean, that's that's. Uh, uh, I mean, the second question is 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 subjective that way because we can't speculate whether. this president would continue in the coming years it's been set and obviously uh, there would be expectations they would be pushing and they would be cribbing and crying so that has happened this year as well for instance uh, our olympic medalist from last games sachi malik and she won the khel ratna for her olympic bronze medal in 2016 and that's the highest ihr award compared to arjuna 
and then she applied for arjuna this year and it's it's a little uh, i mean it's difficult to understand why she applied this year as well because she has been on the downwards slide ever since the last games and this year she even lost in the national trials so uh, but in any case she applied mirabai chanu applied both of them were kel ratna awardees on previous occasions and both of them were initially there in the short list so initially it was 29 arjuna awards apparently and then when the final list was uh, published uh, approved uh, they excluded these two and uh, yesterday uh, sakshi has uh, written a letter to pm and the sports minister saying that what should i do to get this award so it's so these kind of i mean every year when the awards come there is a lot of uh, you and cry as to we deserved it we, uh, people are people who are undeserving gets get it and people who deserve don't get it so that happens i guess in all the i mean it it doesn't happen in any of the other awards i guess if you if you consider the padma awards or right. of any of any of any of those instituted awards by the by the government so here it happens because there is a lot of uh, subjectivity in the process and there is a lot of loopholes which is exploited by people who have who have connections uh, within the network people who are politically right. savvy let's let's put it that way right. athletes who are politically savvy so how do you counter that that answers your first first question uh, how do you streamline the system it's i mean it's india we are talking about and it's very difficult to take that part out of it because at some level uh these things are bound to happen right. uh, the be- the uh, the best way to go about it is probably to completely do away with the nomination i mean this is this is just a just an idea that way completely do away with the nomination the criteria are already there let the jury or the let the committee that is convened every year decide on a short list based on the performance See, performances are out there you don't have to be nominated to understand who did what in the sporting world for india because our performances it's not like we are the top most sporting country in the and we have 600 700 athletes to pick from right so decide on a short list and from there deliberate and bring out with avoid the nomination process altogether let the power to uh, short list the nominees a short list short list at least for the awards rest completely on the Uh, committee every year and let empower the committee fully right. and oversee that with the with the rule book and implement it it requires implementation rule books are the rule book is pretty straight forward and it's it's set right. properly right. it's just that the implement implementation factor uh, remains ambiguous and this nomination procedure i believe it began at the early stages 60s arjuna awards started so at that point i guess to push at least you required some kind of nomination because unlike these days information and information about performances and all that was not out in the open and in public domain or in social media or in instagram right so i i deliberately said instagram because <laughs> there is a joke during the rounds that some of the awardees are those who did instagram live with with the sports minister so that's a joke but yeah so so everything is out there so why not why not uh, do that in a direct fashion like like some of the other awards that we see where the nomination is done by the by the by the committee themselves and not not by any extent that that at least cuts off 50% of the politics that could be played of course some element would still remain but that that imperfection will remain in indian sport thank you lesdi for talking to us In our next segment, we bring you a series of conversations on new rules that are being framed for digital trade by rich and powerful countries in the World Trade Organization. Lynn Fries brings you more details. While most countries are focused on coping with COVID-19 and its aftermath, some rich countries are pursuing an expansionist free trade agenda at the World Trade Organization. One example of this is an effort underway to establish new rules globally. for digital trade. Digital Trade Rules, a disastrous new constitution for the global economy by and for big tech, authored by Deborah James, was the topic of a recent book launch and webinar. This report features highlights of some key points 
contributed by Deborah James at that webinar. We go now to our featured clips. Uh, thank you so much to uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung uh, for publishing the paper and for organizing this seminar. And to Roland and to all of my excellent co-panelists, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, just to say, Our World is Not for Sale is a global network of about 250 groups from the global north and south, from about 50 different countries. And we oppose the current model of corporate globalization and we work together for a democratic, sustainable and fair multilateral uh, trading system. So today, uh, I'm going to share with you three major points. We're here to talk about the digital trade rules that the big tech corporations are pushing in the WTO and in other forum. So I'm gonna talk about the origin of the talks. Why are we having this discussion? I'll give you a brief status of Update, and then I'm going to focus on the implication of the rules. So a uh, couple of basic points. Technology obviously can stimulate prosperity and development. It can bring us closer together and help build sustainable livelihoods. We are not anti-technology. But it can also constrain development. It can exacerbate inequalities and it can destroy jobs and ways of life. So whether countries workers and consumers everywhere will benefit from new technology or whether the benefits will only accrue to a teeny tiny minority will be determined by the rules which set the playing field for how digitalization will evolve over time and the important point is who is setting those rules now one of the best investments that corporations can make is to change the rules under which they operate so that they can extract greater profits from the economy while preventing their competitors from having a level playing field. Now, powerful corporations have long used their surplus profits to invest in the undemocratic practice of trade policymaking, to use trade agreements to lock in rules promoting their rights to make profits while limiting government's ability to regulate them in the public interest often through policies that they could not have advanced through democratic channel. The World Trade Organization, as we know, is the global rulemaking body on international trade. Big tech and other corporations operating in transport, logistics, telecoms, finance, agribusiness, industrial, many other sectors, are lobbying governments to use the WTO to liberalize the digitalization that is currently transforming the global economy. And particularly the governance of today's most valuable resource, which is data. So what's a quick status update? Well, in 2016, the Obama administration first proposed rules on digital trade in the WTO after hiring a corporate tech lobbyist under the guise of e-commerce talks in the WTO. Proponents tried to get all 164 members to agree to a new mandate to negotiate binding rules on digital trade and to permanently push aside the development agenda, which has been pending since 1995, okay? But developing countries resisted the imposition of this new corporate agenda, and they blocked the new mandate at the last WTO ministerial, which was in Buenos Aires in December 2017. However, a group of 76 countries launched talks among themselves to bring about a binding agreement on digital trade in the WTO. Now, these nations are constantly lobbying and pressuring other developing countries that are not participating also to join their ranks. Their aim is to conclude an agreement involving as many countries as possible, as well as to secure a mandate for talks among members of the WTO, all the members, by the time of the next ministerial conference. So that was supposed to occur last month, um, but it's been postponed at this time. Now, one of the characteristics of the contemporary global economy is that while the productivity of workers and small businesses has increased over time, obviously, Large corporations continually take more and more than their share. As I mentioned, they have used their surplus profits to intervene in the policymaking process to design the market to distribute more of the gains to themselves. Now, this process has been facilitated by digitalization, and the proposed rules are intended to lock in and accelerate that appropriation of the productivity of workers. So in reality, big tech has proposed the rules in order to consolidate its exploitative business model. So what does it include? It includes gaining rights to access markets globally. They wanna be around the world. They wanna lock in deregulation and they wanna evade and prevent future regulation. They want to access an unlimited supply of cheap labor that has been stripped of its rights 
They want to expand their power through monopolies. They want to avoid payment of taxes. And now the newest aspect, they want to be able to extract and control personal, social, and business data around the world. Data is the lifeblood of the digital economy. So whichever firms dominate artificial intelligence, intelligence in their sectors by virtue of their big data set will dominate their industries. Think about the fact that US-based big tech, transnational corporations, Google, Apple, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft are now five of the six largest corporations in the world. Now the proponents are disguising their proposals in the Trojan horse of being able to Unleash development through the power of micro, small, and medium enterprises using e-commerce. These are not e-commerce rules. They go far beyond e-commerce and would result in the liberalization of all aspects of the economy. They really represent a new constitution, binding global rules on the entire digital economy written by big tech for its own benefit. Now, these rules were already in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it's in the TPP. They also currently exist in the EU, uh, Japan, uh, FTA and the US-Japan FTA and in the renegotiated NAFTA, the so-called US-Mexico-Canada Agreement. So if your country is a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you already have these rules. If you're part of USMCA, um, if you are EU with Japan, you already have them. But that doesn't mean that they have to be uh, exported to the whole world because they are much harder to change if they are agreed in the WTO. Between the EU and Japan, you can change it when you finally decide that it makes no sense for your countries. Um, but we need to not happen in the WTO. We need to make a change and we need to make sure that our activities that we're advocating for, if they're economic justice, racial justice, you know, data privacy, whatever, that they include also paying attention to the rules that are being developed globally. And we have uh, lots of room for growth within our world is not for sale, for more groups to join, to participate in this fight. We need to make a change and we need to get the rules that we need, worker rights, more taxation, anti-monopoly, and stop them from implementing the rules that they want, which will really have such a devastating impact on our lives for the future. Because once you get these rules in the WTO, forget ever changing them. That is a problem. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.